the Rangers blew a chance to take an early series win against the Houston Astros with some not great pitching, some not great umpiring, and unfortunately, yet again, we're hit with even more injury news. We're talking about all that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on YouTube and on your favorite podcasting platform, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, before we get into the more bad injury news on the Rangers front, what's leading to some of these injuries, some updates, and who is going to end up leaving this rotation once those starting pitchers get back and healthy. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Now, the Rangers blew a chance to win this series to take three out of four against the Astros, who had been scuffling early, and just a weird, wacky, Deeply unfun game of baseball for almost everybody involved. Now, I thought this was going to be Justin Foscue's first MLB start, but that was not the case as Justin Foscue has landed on the 10-day IL with left oblique strain. And Davis Wenzel will be coming up to hopefully make his Major League debut at some point. We'll see when and how and why. We'll talk more about that later on once we get to more of the injury news. But uh, this game was also just filled with injuries because Framber Valdez was supposed to start this game. That's why I thought Justin Foscue was finally going to get his first MLB start after getting his first MLB hit, which was an RBI single off of the guy who most people consider the best closer in the game for the last couple of years in Josh Hader. He felt a tweak in his left side and he went on the IL and he was supposed to start against lefty Framber Valdez, but that did not happen. Unfortunately, Framber Valdez missed this start. I think the Rangers might have taken him to town. They felt pretty good about how they they did against him in the last couple of times that they faced him, both those coming in the ALCS. Um, But they did not face him. They faced a poor young kid. It it takes a lot for me to feel bad for an Astros player facing off against the Rangers. But uh, this MLB debut for the Arlington native Blair Henley, it, it made me feel bad. It was a last-minute emergency call-up against the defending World Series champs with one of the most dangerous lineups in baseball. And here you go, kid. It was just feeding him to the wolves. And it was a very, very forgettable first start. Ends the day with an ERA of 135. Uh, that's, That's not great for those of you scoring at home. And it honestly could have been a whole lot worse if not for Seth Martinez coming in and looking amazing for three and two-thirds innings. I mean, the story of this game ended up being just random relievers being absolutely amazing. Jose Urania, four innings of just allowing one hit, four strikeouts, shutout baseball for four innings, saving this Rangers bullpen from having to throw more because the rest of this bullpen, the starting staff, didn't do a great job. But a lot of that came on the backs of some just... Yet again, terrible umpiring. Now, overall, a very good day for Adrian Johnson, but mainly because he got all of his terrible calls out of the way real early, and they all happened to go against the Rangers. Now, you look at the umpire scorecards tweet from this game, and you see all three of the most impact missed calls came against the Rangers and came in that first inning. Heaney had to throw a lot of pitches in that first inning, 33 pitches, and he shouldn't have had to throw that many, because he was robbed of two different strikeouts. One to Jeremy Pena with the bases loaded. That would have made it a two-out game that ended up scoring a run on an RBI ground out for him. And then Kyle Tucker, who had a 2-2 count, which was even more egregious. The one the one to Pena was, was borderline, a 1-2 count. And what should have been a strike three was called a ball. But to Tucker, a 2-2 count, a fastball right in there, the top quarter of the zone, like you could not place it more perfectly very obviously a strike 
And that was rule the ball. Tucker ended up walking, and that ended up extending or really starting the rally. There's already a single, and then Tucker walks, and then Jordan Alvarez is scored on basically the next hitter, and things just kind of spiraled from there. And once you have a 33-pitch first inning, it is really difficult to come back for that. And in general, I hate talking about the umpires because it's normally just such a lame thing. I especially hate doing it on back-to-back days. But automatic balls and strikes is not something that Rangers fans should be calling for. Even after these past two games of some really egregious missed calls by umpires. And the reason for that is Jonah Heim. Every year that Jonah Heim has been a starting catcher for the Rangers, since 2021, he has been in the top 3% of Major League Baseball in terms of runs gained by framing. He's one of the best at it, consistently. It is a valuable skill, and usually when you see other fan bases complaining about it, it's because their catchers aren't as good at it, and so they get mad when it happens against them, and... It still happens against every team because eventually there are good framing catchers. Yiner Diaz is actually a pretty solid framer um, and, you know, stole quite a few strikes in that Sunday game. Um, But this Rangers team has been consistently one of the best at framing runs. Bobby Wilson is the best catching coordinator, I think, best catching coach in Major League Baseball because no matter who the Rangers have behind the, the dish, whether it's Andrew Kisner or whether it's Jonah Heim, I think Jonah Heim in this one probably would have stolen those strikes. I think that that um, I think that might have you know actually sorry Jonah Heim was in this no Kisner was in this that's what it was maybe that's the difference is is Kisner versus Jonah Heim Kisner's not a very highly rated defensive backup he's more there for his offense which is ironic because he's 0 for 8 to start the season um, but this is one where Andrew Heaney really could have used that framing of Jonah Heim and so I think what the solution is is eventually going to be it's not going to be robot umpires. The technology is also not there yet. It's not ready. It it's, it's, would be worse than Major League umpires right now, empirically. For the most part, umpires do a really good job at a really difficult job. But the ones that really stick in your craw, the most egregious ones, those could be fixed with the automatic balls and strikes challenge system that is already in play in AAA. It is working, and it is something that I think should be considered being implemented now. Yesterday, I mean, the worst calls that are so obvious that have such serious implications can change the course of a game in that first inning. And the, the third most egregious call was one to Marcus Simeon, where he ended up grounding out into a double play. It was a 1-1 count, the most high leverage count in baseball. The next pitch determines so much of how hitters do versus batter, versus pitchers. If you have a 2-1 count versus a 1-2 count, it is an extreme difference in OPS. It was a one-out, bases-loaded situation. Instead of having a hitter's count in 2-1, he had a pitcher's count in 1-2, and he ended up grounding into a double play. The Rangers already scored five runs and were leading 5-2, and it could have led a little bit more. The ball that he hit was an expected batting average over 400, but... The Astros end up turning double play, and that is the end of the Rangers' offense for the game. You can quibble about how little they hit for the rest of that game, but still, it was just a really another really bad call early on in the game that's really frustrating. And it's just, it's not what you want to see in the game, and I'm hoping that that automatic balls and strikes challenge system can be implemented sooner as opposed to later. And I, I feel bad for Blair Henley. I mean, he got one out. And it took him, what, 33 pitches? Yeah, literally 33 pitches to get his first and only out. And had it not been for that ground into a double play, his ERA might be somewhere in the 200 or 300 range. A rough first day for a guy who grew up being a Rangers fan. Um, maybe his, his, I'm sure his second start in the big leagues won't be that bad. And maybe it won't be against the Rangers. But still, incredibly frustrating despite all that, despite those missed calls of Andrew Heaney not being able to get the job done, not being able to go deep, and not being able to take advantage of being spotted a five spot in the first inning. He came back out there and gave up two more runs in the second inning. He ended his day going three and two-thirds innings, six runs, all of them earned three walks, four hits, including a home run. But some of those runs weren't on him. Some of them were on the bullpen, which we'll get into this bullpen and a little bit of an injury update as well as if I think Andrew Heaney is going to stick in this rotation when some of these injured starters come back. Right after this word from our sponsors. 
This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is literally the best way to get tickets for anything you want. Sports, music, comedy, theater. No matter what you want, they have got it, including Major League Baseball games. If you want to get in on the action, go check out this Rangers A's series. Get a, a nice series that will be hopefully less stressful for you. Or if you want to go check out Frisco Rough Riders, or, or no matter what you're looking for, Game Time has got all kinds of great deals. It is the best way. It is the easiest way. It is the fastest and most convenient way to get your tickets and it's the cheapest. The game time guarantee means if you see a, a deal with a, a ticket in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% the difference. Game time guarantee is the best way to ensure that you are getting the best deal on these tickets no matter what. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code first pitch. Terms apply. Again, that's code F I R S T P I T C H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, I don't want to get too much more into this game that the Rangers lost on Monday night, a 10 to 5 final, because it's just kind of one of those early ones you want to throw away, but still frustrating the Rangers drop a five spot in the bottom of the first inning and could not come home with the win. I thought it was not a great day, obviously, for Brock Burke, but not as bad as I think his line looked, especially since he was coming on with two outs and he had Jordan Alvarez down 0 2, and he throws a slider down below the zone, well below the zone. And Jordan Alvarez just hooks it for a, a two-run double because, of course, he does. Because, of course, Jordan Alvarez does. And then Grant Anderson comes in and does allow three hits, and one of them is a three-run bomb that really puts this game out of reach. But the two hits he allowed before, he got out of the jam that Brock Burke couldn't in that fourth inning. And the two hits that he allowed before were just very weakly hit balls. Now, the pitch that he threw to Caratini was a fastball at the top of the zone that he doesn't really have the kind of stuff where you can rely on that, like an Andrew Heaney or Jacob Gagram or somebody with a little bit more velocity and spin can do. But overall, not a horrible day. And then you get a good day from Jose Ureña, four shutout innings. That is not insignificant. Facing the minimum because he got a double play on the one hit that he allowed in those final four innings of work. So a frustrating day, very frustrating to see Heaney not be able to go deep in this game, but not as frustrating as this offense trying up for the final eight innings of this game. They had a very typical Rangers first inning of just hit, single, walk, walk, hit by pitch, all those kind of little just stranding together a bunch of base runners, and that is the key hallmark of this offense, but not getting able to get anything done against the B side of this Astros pen, Seth Martinez, uh, Tay Scott, you know, Burt Belak, like that's that's more frustrating for me than blowing this lead because Andrew Heaney wasn't able to go deep into a game because that's kind of what Andrew Heaney does. But the more frustrating news is Justin Foscu landing on that 10-day IL with a left oblique strain. Davis Wenzel is coming up and now to make room on the 40-man roster because the Rangers weren't going to call up a guy on their 40-man roster. They had another guy, another infielder available in Jonathan Ornelas. But the Rangers believe in Davis Wenzel, a supplemental first-round pick from 2019 out of Baylor. And, uh, yeah, he's going to be a big leaguer. Congratulations to Davis Wenzel. But the bad news is not only Justin Foscue getting hurt, and who knows how long that left oblique is going to take to heal. Those things can take usually take a lot more than 10 days. The Rangers still don't know exactly how long it's going to be for Foscue, but it's safe to say it's probably going to be a little bit more than the 10-day minimum on the IL. And now Josh Young has been moved to the 60-day IL to create that 40-man roster spot for Davis Wenzel, which means Josh Young isn't coming back until at least June 1st at this point. And it's not great. It's not great news for the Rangers who get dealt yet another injury. They did get some good news on Nathaniel Lowe. He'll be taking batting practice today for the first time, and he's probably still about a week away. Also, Jacob DeGrom is now throwing from 90 feet, which is 15 feet further than he, than he was throwing before. So that's nice. Another step in the right direction for Jacob DeGrom, who will hopefully come back sometime in August. We will see what that looks like, and we'll get another rehab start from Michael Lorenzen, I believe tonight or maybe tomorrow, and then... I'm thinking sometime next week he will be rejoining this Rangers rotation. And after this most recent rehab start, he will be built up to 90 pitches, which is much more the workload you're looking for 
for a starting pitcher in this rotation. But, I mean, it just grows the amount of injuries that this Rangers team is suffering. You look at the 60-day IL, now it includes Jacob DeGrom, Tyler Malley, Carson Coleman, and Josh Young. 15-day IL, you still got Max Scherzer, Michael Lorenzen, Josh Boris, Jonathan Hernandez is on there as well. And then the 10-day IL includes Nathaniel Lowe and Justin Foscue. So on the Rangers IL, they have a combined five Cy Young Awards, 14 All-Star appearances, a Silver Slugger, and a Gold Glover. And that's not even including Tyler Malley, who's pretty darn good as well. And a bunch of relievers who have the promise. And Justin Foscue, who is hitting 500 in his big league career through two plate appearances, which I would have loved to have seen more. But that's not how this works. And there has been an epidemic of pitcher injuries the last few years. And MLBPA is, is, seems to be blaming it on the pitch clock, which I don't think it's not a factor. But I don't think it's a significant factor by any means. I think that the main significant factor is that a lot of these pitchers are throwing very, very hard, and the human body was not meant to throw a ball 100 times every five days and throw that baseball 95 to 100 miles an hour every five days, or 90 to 100 miles an hour. It's just not built for that, especially... When these kids are throwing so much, it's it's more of, I think, a problem with the youth baseball and how hard these kids are being encouraged to throw from high school and how many injuries are there. Some of the top top doctors in baseball that do most of these surgeries are saying, you know, when they first started, um, I believe it was Dr. James Andrews that was was quoted um, in a major league baseball study that, you know, when he first started doing these surgeries back, you know, in the year 2000 or so, he'd do like six to 10 of them a year. And they were almost all major league baseball players or minor league baseball players or or college players and very, very few at the youth baseball level. But that's not the case anymore. It's reversed. The vast majority of these surgeries, there's so many of them, way more than six to 10 of them a year. And a lot of them are coming from these youth baseball players. I really want to get a chance to read The Arm by Jeff Passan, a book that he wrote, what, five, six, eight years ago? It's been a while about the rash of these arm injuries, and it's just the nature of the game. It, it is the nature of throwing baseballs this hard, and I don't know exactly what Major League Baseball can do to change it. There's got to be some fixes. I don't think the pitch clock is helping, but also it's just the nature of this game. And I remember the Rangers being so clowned so heavily for signing you know Jacob DeGrom because oh this guy is so injury prone Uh, yeah everybody is when you're a pitcher there is no question that everybody is vulnerable to this heck even Max Scherzer who thankfully hasn't had an elbow injury had been healthy for his entire what 18 year 17 15 year career and finally at age 39 father time is starting to catch up with them and he had a back injury and missed significant time th- is missing significant time this year and and had the terrorist major injury that landed him on the I- il for a significant stint last year as well and even justin verlander has had tommy john surgery a guy who's been the peak of durability and we even saw with lucas giolito this year with the boston red sox he's been the most durable pitcher in baseball the last four years and and who knows when he when or if he's pitching this year spencer strider We saw it with Shane Bieber. We saw it with um, Yuri Perez. It's just all around baseball. And so I don't think that there is one catch-all solution. And I think that this overblown fixation on the pitch clock is, is not healthy. It's not the right step of focusing on what needs to be focused on. I don't think there have been enough independent studies that are not being supported by Major League Baseball because it should be said that for owners, which you know, make up the main entity of Major League Baseball, this is eventually in their best interest to keep these arms suppressed, keep this value suppressed so the pitchers don't get these big contracts, so that they are cheaper and so that they can make more profit. But it's the exact opposite for the Major League Baseball Players Association, who doesn't have the most, you know, Good rela- doesn't have the best relationship with Major League Baseball right now after that contentious um, winter where a lot of these pitchers that wanted to get paid big bucks 
didn't get paid big bucks, and not to mention the CBA negotiation that was very, very contentious uh, a couple years ago and that led to the lockout. It's not a great time for the league right now, but this is a hugely pressing issue. It is something that I think is getting better, especially with the improved no longer being called Tommy John surgeries. There was a big article in the Dallas Morning News early on this spring talking with Dr. Keith Meister, the Rangers team doctor, about the modified UCL repair surgery that is more of a stint and has had a better success rate and has led to fewer failures, which is you know great for Major League Baseball. And, and hopefully, as we're starting to see more of these processes you know, come into play, it's not the traditional Tommy John surgery. It's a little bit different, which is why a lot of these UCL repair surgeries, like Jacob DeGrom's, like I think think Shohei Otani's, but I don't know for sure, they're not being called Tommy John surgeries as much anymore as UCL repair. So I think that it's a definitely a big problem in Major League Baseball. Hopefully the Rangers will get all these guys back when they're expected and fully healthy, but it's a problem and it is not just a Rangers problem. And so before you go calling any pitcher injury prone, just remember that that tag applies to literally all of them. Coming up to talk about what the Rangers need to do to get right and who of these starters is most likely and would do best if they were moved to the bullpen. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. So don't miss your chance to add your favorite baseball players from the diamond into your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less, then add them to your prize picks entry today. Price Picks is the best way to get in on the action in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Price Picks even offers injury insurance, which seriously seems like everybody needs these days. So if your favorite injury, if your favorite player gets hurt, if you have a player who registers more than who two played appearances or fewer, then Price Picks will have your back and not count that as a loss. Price Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. So download the Price Picks app today. Use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the app today. Use code LOCKDOWNMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Now, let's take a little bit of a look at the bigger picture for your Texas Rangers. Right now, they are 6-4 and atop of the division in first place with an expected wins-loss record of 7-3 and because they have put some runs on some teams and lost some close games. Not very many blowouts. The first real blowout loss, I could say, is that 10-5 to loss last night. But overall, about where you want this team to be, about 500 for the first couple of months of the season while you're waiting on those reinforcements to get back. Um, Michael Lorenzen isn't back yet. Max Scherzer isn't back yet. Tyler Malley isn't close to being back yet. And neither is Jacob deGrom. So you're hoping to stay in the hunt. And right now, this Rangers team is doing so. Would have been very nice to get a series win against the Astros, especially early on, especially when you're in the middle of this 17-game and 17-day stretch. Now, the Rangers really need to take at least two out of three from this Oakland A's team that just won a series against Detroit, which is not a slouch team, but it only gets harder from here. You're in four days into that 17-day, 17-game stretch, and you have split the series at home. Then you end it with a 10-game road trip against teams that I think all have playoff aspirations, the Astros four games in Detroit, and then three games in Atlanta to end this trip, which is a brutal way to end this trip. So right now, just keep your head above water and wait for those reinforcements to come back that can hopefully help your rotation stay a little bit lengthier, not have to put too much pressure on them early on, that you can hopefully keep them all mostly healthy or at least mostly effective as those reinforcements start to trickle back in, the first of which I think will be Michael Lorenzen, Hopefully in that series in Detroit, I don't think he's going to be back in time for the Astros series. So that's about when you're expecting that guy back. And at that point, I think the Rangers will go to a six-man rotation, at least through the end of this stretch. So April 22nd, I think, is when the Rangers will look to make more of a move in their rotation. But at this point, let's let's look at who the options are. Nate Eovaldi, number one starter. 
hopefully can come in and end this losing streak before it turns from two games that stunk into three games that stunk. He is not going anywhere in this rotation ever as long as he's healthy. Then you have Dane Dunning, who's been mostly solid this year. Bradford, who's two starts in and has looked excellent in both of those starts against two very good lineups in the Cubs and the Astros. Then you have Andrew Heaney and John Gray, who I thought might be the Rangers' number two and three starters. Um, Flip-flop, John Gray is the number two and Andrew Heaney is the number three early on this season while the Rangers waited for those guys to come back. But at this point, that has not been the case. It's been a rough couple of starts for both of those guys. I think Gray is more likely to pick it up, and I trust him more to be a solid mid-rotation starter than Heaney at this point. But in terms of guys in this starting rotation right now that you feel good about starting a playoff game, well, there's Nate Eovaldi, and I think at that point, that's it. I think the Rangers have plenty of guys who hopefully if they all come off the IL and and look as good as they are expected to look, look like their normal selves, the Rangers will have a stacked playoff rotation. But as we all know, injuries happen and injury returns can take sometimes more time than we would like or expect. And sometimes even when guys get back and they're healthy, they're just not quite right, not quite the full version of themselves. And so as for who I think goes in the rota- who goes in the bullpen at this point, I think it's easy to say Andrew Heaney right now because he's got a seven and a half ERA through his two starts and has averaged, you know, a little over four innings per start. Or you look at John Gray, who's got an ERA over six and has averaged what three and a half ish innings per start. He's got seven and a third innings in two starts. Neither of them have been the best version of themselves. Dunning has also been a little more walk prone than you would like seven walks in 13 innings, not ideal. And Cody Bradford is the only guy among these who has minor league options who could eventually get, you know, sent down, but he's been one of the best. He's been the second best starter to this point. And again, it's all a small sample size, but I think eventually the way this rotation stacks out, I I think that John Gray is one of the few of these guys of these non E of all the guys in this rotation, I think John Gray is the one who I would trust the most if fully healthy, if he's, you know, clicking like John Gray can be clicking. He's the one that I'd feel best about starting in a playoff game. Um, But Cody Bradford just did what he did to the Houston Astros lineup and looked absolutely marvelous in what I think is the best start of any Rangers pitcher this year. Maybe you have all these seven innings against the Rays in Tampa was a little bit better when he just went nutso on those splitters. Um, But still, a marvelous start from Cody Bradford. But I think that eventually, Heaney might be the one that I would be quickest to put in the bullpen. Not just because I don't think he can do, he can be a starter, but mainly because I'm less, I'm least confident about him giving you length. Maybe that'll end up being Cody Bradford. Maybe these first couple of starts were a little, little bit of a mirage. I don't think so. I think that Cody Bradford, when he's on his game, can be a decent back-end rotation starter, and we've seen it. And not just against you know the A's lineup or the Marlins lineup. These have been two playoff-caliber lineups in the Cubs and the Astros. And I think that Heaney, because he can be so finicky, because he does have a lot of problems going deep into games, and because that puts a lot of pressure on your bullpen by having your starters not go five innings a lot of the times not almost ever go six innings and and really just never go seven innings we've seen dunning give you length even when he's roughed up we've seen cody bradford be able to give you a little bit of length even john gray at times when he gets roughed up a little bit he can still get you deep into games and and heaney hasn't really been able to do that he has been a little bit more of a nibbler and he's got really really good strikeout stuff and the rangers don't at this point have a super comfortable, a a really good lefty in their pen. Burke has had some issues this year. We've seen a little bit from Jacob Latz, who's looked pretty good in some small stints. But again, the strikeout stuff, I don't think is quite as much there as Heaney, which I think would play up quite a bit in the pen. And we saw John Gray be incredibly effective for the Rangers in the bullpen in the playoffs last year. I think that eventually he might get shifted there, but it's hard to put your at this point of all these guys, I think John Gray is making the second most money. It's and has been in the league and been an effective starter. The second most to Evaldi of these 
five guys here. Even more so, he's got a longer track record than Michael Lorenzen of being a capable big league starter, at least average mid-rotation starter. And so it's a difficult question at this point. I'm hesitant to shove any of these guys in the pen during this 17-game and 17-day stretch because we saw Heaney's velocity down significantly in this game against the Astros. I don't know if that's just early season, uh, and that's just kind of how things go, but having basically all of his pitches be you know, a mile an hour at, below um, what they're normally being thrown at, outside of the curveball which was up a tick but fastball down a, a mile and a half per hour change up down a mile an hour slider down 1.3 miles per hour that's concerning and so all these guys have their you know injury concerns because not only are they pitchers they have been injury prone pitchers in well not Bradford and Dunning but you've always had some concerns Heaney's had some concerns Gray has had some concerns as well and you have another option in there if the Rangers do want to move multiple of these guys to the pen, or if you know somebody gets hurt, they have Jose Urania, who I know it's been three games and seven and third innings, but they've been some really, really good seven and the third innings, and they've been in big spots. He's worked himself into and out of jams, and those four innings of shutout baseball to give the Rangers at least a chance to claw back in that game against the Astros on Monday, that wasn't nothing. And so I think that's something the Rangers are considering. I don't think that Jose Urania is going to be on the chopping block. And I think that they'd probably send, you know, Cody Bradford back down to the minors or, or move Dunning the bullpen before they would consider just straight up cutting Urania, who doesn't have any minor league options. He's on a major league contract at this point. So if you send him down or move him out of this role, then you've got to just get rid of him. And I don't think the Rangers want to do that at this point. So the Rangers is going to be a wait and see situation. Hopefully the, Andrew Heaney can get better calls in the next game and go deeper than three and two third innings. And hopefully John Gray can get himself out of whatever funk he's been in and stop walking the world and stop, you know, not striking out guys and giving up hard contact. And maybe Cody Bradford and Dane Dunning can continue what they've done pretty well early the season. But the Rangers, again, still really, really need some big innings from Eovaldi. Hopefully Lorenzen comes back and looks like the all-star version of himself that he was in the first half last year. And hopefully Max Scherzer can come back in around that May, mid-May return and give the Rangers exactly what they need. Hopefully an all-star caliber pitcher, but at the very least, someone who can get you those innings because they are so, so important right now. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.